when it makes a little noise. How exciting. <laughs> okay. So everyone, welcome to the second, I'm calling it the ghost stories time. Now, originally I mentioned about actually doing a tour and actually taking you out with me on the streets. Now, that is still absolutely on the books. Now, what day exactly on the books? We're going to have a vote on that again, which I will put on the Patreon and everybody gets to vote on once more. Um, the reason why I'm not going out tonight is, I'll be real with you, uh, things I've been talking with my therapist about is things like burnout and balancing my time and that kind of thing. My mind is having a fight with my body on functioning right now. Um, I thought about this a lot and I've been under the weather for the last few days and I concluded that I still wanted to meet with all of you tonight, though for me to be balancing my physical health alongside my spiritual health and being able to keep up the necessary protections while also doing the performance element of a tour just seemed, I'll be real, dangerous for me this evening. So. I'm still gonna be telling the stories. I'm gonna be showing you some stuff with a green screen behind me. And what I would like to do for the future, because I would like for this to become a more regular thing on Patreon, is to spend more time out at these places. So rather than it be a full tour, it'll be part tour and inf informative experience. But I also want it to be a kind of chance where if people want to test their own abilities to kind of get a sense for things that are going on, they can do that. So that way it's also a learning experience as well. And it's always a very supportive experience as well with like, okay, what are you getting? You know, like, how can we work on that? How are you feeling? A very checking kind of thing. So it's also going to be, I guess, kind of part experience, but also kind of like a part class a little bit too, for those who are looking to learn either from myself, from Jay, um, from other people that I have in my life who I am learning from, or most importantly from each other. So that being said, Thanks everybody for joining this. This is what I am calling the uphill tour. Um, yes, I'm glad. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I'm glad that you're excited about that. Um, the uphill tour is going to consist of the Bergwin Wright House. And when I say uphill, we're literally going about 40 feet above sea level. There's in Wilmington, we're on top of a sand hill. Um, and yeah, we'll be going from the Bergwin Wright House. We're going to go check out uh, virtually the courthouse. We're going to be checking out St. James Graveyard. We're going to be checking out um, the Bellamy Mansion, and then we're going to be checking out Gallows Hill. Um, Gallows Hill, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I hope you get better soon, Kat. Um, yeah, Gallows Hill was especially one that I had to be careful about going out in my particular state right now, because that was a place that really messed with me when I didn't know how to ground and shield and protect. So when we actually go there at a point in the future, that's going to be a place in particular that I'm going to tell everybody like, yo, ground and shield from wherever you are at, because there's a lot of energy and I want everybody to be safe. That being said, primarily, we're just going to be looking at pictures, but there's still energy with the pictures. So if at any time, if anybody's kind of like, woo, I don't really feel right, take a moment breathe, ground, shield, it's okay. You can mute if you need to, come back, that kind of thing. I'm not expecting that to happen, but I just wanna honor everybody's process. If you get any weird feelings or something like that, just you know, honor your own process, honor how you're feeling on things. And we will be here and you can ask about it you know, at the end of the story or something like that. And we will go into that. So on the first tour on Wednesday, uh, we went into more of the history of Wilmington on why it is so haunted and why it is so amped up the way that it is. So rather than reiterate that again, I'm going to start going to these different places to talk about the things that happen there that have to do with those things like when yellow fever came through when the civil war was coming through when the revolutionary war was coming through so if you want a little bit more context on the historical significance of that check the first part um, i just posted it today it's now public and i'll put that back up on patreon as well um, so let us start what picture should i use first okay we're gonna go to the courthouse Maybe. Okay. So the courthouse. Um, and this was a particularly beautiful day that I took this photo. Um, 
This is the new Hanover County Courthouse, and I love the architecture that is used here. You can see there's this new annex that's like right over here. Um, the courthouse now takes up the entire block in kind of different facets. And originally, though, and if you ever go inside the courthouse, which, by the way, if you're in Wilmington, you absolutely can because taxes pay for it and we have access to go inside. You can go inside this building here, the historical building, and they have this beautiful big mural that's on the wall, and it shows what this block used to look like. There used to be a home on this block, and there used to be this lovely kind of square park that you could walk around on and just kind of walk off the stresses of going to court that day. Um, the building was completed in the 1890s, and it's that's the thing it's still standing today it's still being used as a public building court related but court things don't happen here anymore um this second story right here is a big open room that's where the court used to be held and if you follow the lore that is my life um it's that second story where a lot of things went down almost a year ago now so i will back up on that and kind of start from the beginning when I was doing ghost tours, that was between 2018 and 2020, this particular location was only visited by myself and one other tour guide at the time. So it, the story was short and to be honest, there wasn't a lot of information to it. It was a lot of kind of like hearsay. There wasn't a lot of historical documentation that had yet there that had been found. It was just sort of like, basically without going too far into it, a, a lover's dispute and a very quick and unsettling end from that clock tower. So what I will say is others have seen a woman up in the clock tower and I myself have also seen a woman there. I've also seen her on the second floor here. Now who she is and what she's doing there, I have yet to figure that out. So that part of the ghost story yes it's been seen not only by me but other people in town as well then there's this guy <laughs> the guy you probably all know who i'm about to talk to once again if you follow the lore that is my life um he was said to have some kind of romantic something or another with this woman and it's because he did not, that that's why I started to pick up on things. So this is a huge place of where my spiritual mm, acceptance of what was going on started to happen. And I really owe a lot of that to a woman who came on my tour. And she, like, what I loved about her was she didn't just come on the tour and be like, I'm a medium and I know things. No, it was actually like her daughter and I think like her niece who kept like kind of poking her and they, they kept coming up to me and they're like, yeah, so she's she's a medium. She like knows things sometimes. It's totally weird. And all the while she's just like, yeah. <laughs> so she was going on the tour and at different stops, she would actually give in in indications on things that she was picking up on before I had told the stories. So I was like, okay, okay, this woman's legit, okay. But not in an annoying way. It wasn't like a, I know things. It was just very much a, yeah, you know, like there was one stop. She was like, oh, I feel like there are kids here. And I was like, you would be correct. So we get to the courthouse. And at this time, I had already started to tell my own version of the courthouse story. Over months of time, I would tell the story that I was given, but then I would start seeing pictures of something else entirely. And then I would start getting weird feelings like I was not telling the truth or that I, what I was saying was insulting. It, it was just like a weird kind of overdose. And on top of that, I didn't know what was going on. I was just like performing and telling the story. So it was that encounter that I remember I was on the opposite side of the street where the photo was taken. And I told the story and the woman kind of comes up to me and she, she just said very kindly, she's like, the man, the man in the story. And I said, yeah, what? And she says, he likes you. Like he likes when you tell the stories. And it was basically indicated that I've been telling the stories correctly, which, you know, we find out later that the version of correct was really just what he wanted me to say. His actual life is still greatly a mystery. So it was that night that I went over and I 
still was like, is this real? I, I had a lot of doubts on myself. And I, I was walking home and I went up to the courthouse and I just sort of understood that I guess he, I didn't know at the time, I wasn't sure that he was standing in front of me. And I just spoke out loud. I was like, hey, um, so the woman, she said you liked my stories. That's really cool, thanks. And I didn't fully know what he said at the time, but there was just kind of this, through my clairsentience and clair empathness um, or clair emotive, I just got the sense of like, yes, you know, finally somebody's listening. And then there was just sort of like a good evening. And that was how my conversations with George began. Now, I think, that I, I can't say that I'm not in part grateful for what happened despite everything because it's because of me starting to talk to George that I started to trust myself. And that was a big life lesson for me. Um, a lot of folks talk about how guides will guide you to something that will help you overall, even if the lesson is very painful at the time. Now, I did not realize everything that would happen. I feel like a lot of my life was really leading up to stuff. Basically for mostly two years, I was just going by, kind of talking to him. People got photos of him occasionally. It was not often, but they would get like this shimmery sort of outline. Unfortunately, I don't have those photos anymore. Of all the photos on my phone to strangely disappear, those were the photos, the ones that he in some form showed up in, which seems right in hindsight. So with that, uh, I think it was also important that to, to an extent, I, I didn't put any pressure on myself to believe what was going on. I didn't tell anybody who I was talking to. Uh, I was really worried about that. And it was finally during the pandemic when we were living in a bus and we had moved away that I started to make these reenactment skits. And I put those on TikTok and long story short, they really took off. And they made me have to analyze what was actually going on. They made me have to think, was it all in my head? What, you know, what was happening? I had to actually write out the dialogue and be like, oh yeah, he did kind of sound like this. And oh yeah, he had this kind of personality. And that's why to this day with consultations, I'm constantly telling people, write stuff out. It will help you process. So yeah, pretty much uh, George gets famous. I also kind of get famous. <laughs> um, and we moved back to Wellington and I start talking to him again. And I came into my own abilities more. The conversation was coming through more clearly. He was very forthcoming in how he came through. And I'll tell you what, despite all of my life and all the people that I've met and all of the protective barriers that I've put between myself and the living, I didn't put any of those up between a spirit because I had never been emotionally hurt by a spirit. You live and you learn. So yeah, he and I started talking more. I finally got validation through my friend Sorsha. She was um, doing jury duty. No, she was uh, going something about a, a change on her records. But um, yeah, she went there and then she sent me a message and she's like, I met George today. And I was like, finally. <laughs> I finally felt validated. I was like, okay, I didn't make it up. Like, this is good. Um, and we had a conversation and things, you know, grew from there. And yeah, my time with George, I, despite it all, I don't regret it. Um, I come out of that experience grateful for my guides, for my found family, and for. I mean, a lot of you found me during that time, and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to share my experiences with others in the hopes that they get to make smarter decisions. <laughs> um, pretty much everything went down, long story short, which is all over the Ghost Gets One playlist. Um, he got too close, and his head got too big, and 
our connection was too much. Uh, I, I felt like I couldn't properly shield against him over time because I had been worn down. And it was scary, honestly. Um, I was still figuring out my inner ear clear audience. And sometimes I wasn't able to figure out which thoughts were mine and which were his. And that was, that was a mind trip. And I think that was the scariest thing to this day when I talk to people and they're like, what's the scariest thing that's happened to you? I'm like being mind tripped by a spirit and doubting myself on what I needed to do about it. So as far as who George is, we know that one of his names was Lewis. Uh, I do know how he died. Both uh, Sorsha saw it um, and Kat actually picked up on it when she was in town. We, mm, this, I think this is on YouTube. We tried to pick up his voice. And instead of picking up his voice, we picked up on everybody else's voice around because at the time he thought it would be funny if people thought I was crazy, if there was no proof of him that could be recorded on our devices. So that was a blow, I'll be real. But we did get other proof of other folks around, some of which we even talked about him, which that was helpful. Everything went down as far as him no longer being on our plane of existence in this building as well. And it happened on the second floor. And what I would give to see security footage from the night of, I believe it was November 11th. It was the full moon in Scorpio. And I won't go into all of that because that is also on YouTube. Though that night was ever changing and it was ever changing because of someone else. Um, and I will get into that someone else on our next stop. But yeah, as far as the courthouse now, a lot of the not so great spirits that were working with George have been cleaned out. Um, I don't think they've been sent to the same place for judgment, so to speak, but like, and when I say judgment, I, I mean just like reflection. Um, they may have split around town. Uh, they may have just decided to move on to whatever they want to move on to. The woman, last I heard, she's still there. Overall though, the courthouse is a pretty quiet place. Um, there's still some residual stuff, primarily in the newer buildings where court cases are actually being held. Though in the older building, it could have changed since then, but it was pretty quiet for a while. Um, and I'll bring attention to what I've said before about ghosts being able to learn about modern things too. George was in his present mind for the most part. He was able to access other court and see what was going on and to challenge the prejudice that he had during his day. Though part of what he was growing from as a ghost was the still reason why he was a ghost in the first place. He didn't want to let go of his judgment, of his anger, of, in part, I think some self-hatred he had for himself, his narcissistic tendencies, that sort of thing. So yeah, he was not good. He was one of the worst I've ever met, gonna be real. Um, and he is not a problem anymore. And I'm, I'm so happy to report that after almost a year of time. So that being said, um, do any of you have questions on the building, the spirits, anything like that before we move on? Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next place. <laughs> All right, here is the Bergwin Wright home. I have done lives here before. I think the staff is absolutely wonderful. What I love about them is they've always been open-minded to the spiritual aspects of things, so long as the history comes first and I Cannot agree with that more. So, Bergen Wright House, I'm gonna give you some history on it, some things that I, goodness, the last time I talked about them on my channel was well before Rupert was a thing, <laughs> or a thing that I was acknowledging publicly, I'll say that. <laughs> so, first of which, 
I want to bring attention to this area down here, this ballast stone. So these stones, except for when it's doing this thing. Okay, so these stones right here, they may come from the UK. Not all of them, but some of them. These are the stones that actually weighed down a ship when it went across the Atlantic or down during the colonies. And this is actually the old remnants, excuse me, of the oldest jail in Wilmington. <laughs> so that jail, the conditions were absolutely terrible. Oh my goodness. Basically there's this level and that's that would have been the street level at the time. And then there was this lower level that's right roughly here. That's where they actually kept people. At the time, there was no door. There was only a trap door on the main floor. And that's how they put prisoners in. Oftentimes, there was no sunlight down there. It was very musty. And by the way, this also sits on an old creek that they rerouted through a tunnel system. So sometimes it would flood. And just imagine being down there with a bunch of guys in the dark, some of you shackled, maybe some of you not. And there's one bucket where you can put your business in. And that bucket is just floating around somewhere and you're just praying that somebody finds it and is kind enough to hold it so it doesn't topple over. And just imagine too, shackles wearing in on your skin and having open wounds in that kind of water. It was a terrible, terrible place to be. Now, that jail, they decided they wanted a new jail. Um, you find this in port cities. Jails are very important. <laughs> uh, so they moved the jail and this became vacant. And that's when John Bergwin came on the scene. He's part of the Bergwin Wright house. And he sees what's left and he's like, ooh, that looks like a great foundation. I'm gonna put a house on it. And so he does. Now, here's the thing. I'll go ahead and say from the jail, it's now storage down there. I haven't felt anything. I did do a recent video going down there and I was just kind of like, this is the cleanest place in the house. <laughs> so in my humble opinion, at least the day that I was down there, a lot of things have been just released and they've gone. And I think that's wonderful. I would hate to be down there. So it's curious. I wonder at what point in time did that energy just sort of clear out? The good news is it's absolutely possible that it can. So, hey, enter the home. So John Bergwin, he was in part around during the early revolution. And though, and basically it's understood that he was a loyalist and he decided that it would be safer to go back to England. This house was occupied by renters during most of the rest of the Revolutionary War and was also occupied by the British Army. This was occupied at least for seven days on and off by General Cornwallis. He had suffered a defeat outside of Guilford County Courthouse in Greensboro, North Carolina. That's where I'm from. And he came over here. And yeah, it's actually it's still called by some locals the Cornwallis home for just seven days that he was here. And yeah, during that occupation, Rupert was around. It's interesting learning about the history because it's helped me kind of piece together Rupert's part in all of this. Um, now, it's understood that there would not have been sentries in front of this house most of the time. Now, Rupert was a sentry. I'm in the understanding that he did have different locations in town. Where I met him, I think part of that was he came there because it was one of the only structures left in Wilmington that he recognized. So Wilmington has burned down almost to its entirety three times. <laughs> um, the most of those homes were colonial homes because they were built with pine they have tar and turpentine on the roofs it takes very little to set off a big flame so i imagine he was kind of wandering around and the energy of this place was recognizable there have been british soldiers in red coats seen on the grounds out here in the garden as well as upstairs which is interesting um rupert was always very clear with me he was never allowed in the house like if you were to go in there, it was something really off or really bad going on. Um, he primarily was outside or on the streets looking at different things. Um, so who those red coats were, I imagine they were officers. Um, and some people, I know people who have said they've seen people that look so clear up there that they thought they were reenactors, but then when they follow them, they disappear. So there's some activity going on there. Um, 
there was a gallows that was built out in this area during the Revolutionary War to scare patriots, basically. Um, there were some torturous sort of things going on in the garden. It would not have been a happy place to visit at the time. Um, yeah, it's, mm. and you know, now you can get married out in those gardens. <laughs> Super great. You can have a like bridal photo shoot. Like it's great. People died there. People died there. Um, and in some very gruesome ways, sometimes they would even leave people up hanging for a few days or weeks for critters to bite on. So, uh, to leave a, to leave an example of what you don't do against the crown. Um, by that time, it was later on in the war. I know Rupert got in um, early in 1781. And it's not that the British were losing quite yet at that point, but they also were angry about the war having taken so long. So they were doing a lot of stuff to be like, nah, we're not taking this. They were raiding um, civilian homes at this point which I also found out Rupert was a part of one time. Uh, not actively involved, but he was there to, you know, be a part of the group. Um, so yeah, this this house had a lot of gruesome things going on, not to mention during yellow fever, it was made, or part of it was made into a makeshift hospital. And the lore that also goes with that is during the yellow fever epidemic, which killed, by the way, um, what was it? Of those left in the town, two-fifths perished from yellow fever in three months. So, very, very bad. Um, this was made into a makeshift hospital, and because so many people were dying so quickly, and a lot of people had started to flee the town, live outside on the outskirts, there weren't enough people to get the bodies up to burial grounds, and so they would just keep them downstairs in the cool cellar until somebody could go get them. And well, I'll tell you what, in the summer, there's there, it's hard to find a cool place. So those bodies were not really being kept. They were just rotting. And I always tell people how awful would it be if you're dying of yellow fever, which is bad enough as it is, because you're coughing up blood, you can't breathe, you're bleeding out your eyeballs, like it's a gruesome way to go. And on top of that, you're smelling the rot of those who are already dead. So this house has seen a lot. There's been a lot going on. It's really haunted. Primarily though, it's haunted by people who just live there. Um, I think some of the rights are there. Uh, the, the, those who are working there, they don't say all the names, even though we have discovered who the people are who are haunting this place, just because they want to be respectful of the families who are still alive and still connected to those people. So I've always been respectful about that. Um, but yeah, going back to Rupert. Yeah, um, I met him. Let's see. So the fence is kind of here. The little place that I use for all of the skits on the green screen, that's just right over here on the corner. The reason why we kind of ran into each other was I was one of the smaller tour guides at the time as in like in stature. And I would kind of duck into this corner and then have people surround me on the sidewalk on the busier nights when like other people would be in the alleyway or other people would be on the stairs. So or like other tours, I mean, and yeah, he joked later that the reason why he woke up was I was standing on his spot. <laughs> so, um, call it fate. Am I right? Um, he was not the only spirit who got pretty active when I was around. It was a running joke between the tour guides that whenever I was around, the activity picked up, people would hear things, people would capture photos. The photos that I'm sharing right now on TikTok and have shared in the past, I got the most at the Bergman Wright home. Even to this day, when I walk by, I just clear inner ear clear audience as I walk by. I get, hi, you know, like from the garden. And I don't even know who it is all the time. I've run into other soldiers. Um, I've run into a little girl. I've seen a little boy. Uh, of course, there are those inside the house. There is a man who kind of seemed in pauper's clothing, who was hanging out on a tree at one point. They're just all over. And they're pretty sentient. Another time I ran into a woman, she told me to move because I was standing on a place where a man had died, which honestly out here, it's kind of hard not to, but whatever reason she was very attached. I've run into her a few times. Um, 
and sorry, my phone's going off. Uh, but there's also a man of some kind of rank that uh, kind of looks over the spirits in the gardens. And that was actually the one that I had to work with to be like, hey, <laughs> Rupert wants to not be in the army forever. Can we like discharge him? And that guy kind of had some issues with it. So we were just like, okay, he's just, he's just going to leave. <laughs> like, he's like really done. It's been 300 years, like wake up. So um, yeah, story with Rupert. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it and I won't go into all the details to spare you though, how he connects to the courthouse. One of the things that stands out to me over time is that George would oftentimes criticize Rupert because he was just coming out of the fog and he was very confused. There were times when he was confused about who I was because he remembered Mary, who was my past life. And he would sometimes look down and kind of just be really thrown off because he would think that he was talking to her and then he would see me and I got to do the, nope, I've been here the whole time. He would ask me questions about, aren't you taller? You know, you were taller just now, or you sounded different just now. And I was just like, so he was coming to a lot of understanding of where his confusion was and also being in his present. And the opposite side of that is George felt very much in his present, though George was not a nice guy and go figure, Rupert turned out to be a really nice guy. At the time though, at the end of, or towards the end of the 2020, when we moved into the Boston, we were about to move away. It was a very strange thing because George, you know, he was supportive. He was just like, hey, don't forget about me. I'd like to see you again. Whereas Rupert was totally different. He was like, you can't go. Like, he was like, you got to take me with you. That kind of desperation was honestly scary and off-putting to me at the time. And the reason for that was I, I was also very worried that he was going to have big problems with Jay. Um, at the beginning, he was angry at Jay because he thought that Jay needed to be walking me home. Whereas I'm like, I'm a full adult, like I can do this. Um, that's the whole reason why I started talking to Rupert more because he was like, let me walk you home. And I was like, you are a stranger, sir. <laughs> I'll walk part way with you, but okay. Um, but yeah, he held resentment against Jay. And Jay was even excited to meet him. I, I told Jay about Rupert. I was like, hey, I don't know if this is real, but I just had a conversation with a red coat halfway up the hill. Um, all the same, he he was jealous of the fact that Jay's corporeally here, um, of Jay's mindset, of his, you know, finding inner peace and balance and that sort of thing. So I said no. And I didn't understand the entirety of the significance at that time, but I was just like, no, this isn't okay. Plus like Jimothy was already hanging out with us at that point. That would have been like totally weird. <laughs> Way too many ghosts in the bus. Way too many. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, from there, we spent about half a year apart. I came back. He didn't talk to me immediately. And then he talked to a friend of mine who was also spiritually sensitive before he talked to me and told my friend that I was his wife. And that was really awkward because <laughs> we both heard or perceived the same word. And my friend was like, I feel like you two have a lot to talk about. And I was like, I don't know what's happening. Uh, so <laughs> we didn't end up talking it out. Um, and I was really impressed with Rupert. I was worried that he would just leave, um, which he was absolutely entitled to do. I'm, I'm always supportive of a spirit that wants to make their own choices. My part in life is to just hopefully bring them to a place where they can be in the present enough to make their own choices. So yeah, Rupert, I came back and uh, that's when we actually started having the conversations that we needed to have. I did a past life regression that confirmed it. Whoop, I knew him in another life. And from there, even though George got worse and was being cruel and you know, kept making fun of him and poking jokes at him being like, and just saying these mean things because Rupert was just trying to figure out who he was still or remember things about his past. All the while, George chose to not remember things about his past. Like there were a lot of dark things there that he would hide. So yeah, long story short, Rupert took care of George. 
George is not a problem anymore. And Rupert was rewarded for that and had his fog taken care of. He remembers more things about his past. It's not like remembering everything about your past because you sometimes have to jog your memory. But yeah, he's a, he's a whole different dude this year <laughs> in a great way. Um, and he's a part of our family now. So yeah, that is the Bergwin Wright house and who I met outside of the Bergwin Wright house. Uh, and the other stories will be hopefully new things that I haven't mostly shared on my TikTok. But that being said, do any of you have any questions about that story, him, anything like that before I move on? Cool, cool. All right. So moving on, going up the hill, we're gonna go to St. James. Yes. So I love this picture of St. James. It is a graveyard. You can see that there as I'm like ugh, over here. Um, I took this, you can see it's um, at dusk and I always love this photo. You can kind of see the graves over here too. So St. James is a block uphill from the Bergen Wright house. So we're going uphill from there. We're crossing third and going up. Um, St. James is the oldest recognized burial ground in Wilmington. And I say recognized because there were certainly burial grounds before the late 1700s in Wilmington because Wilmington uh, colonialists were coming over in the early uh, or in the late 1600s into the early 1700s. And of course there were native peoples who were around here too. So why is this the oldest recognized burial grounds? Because there are certainly people who died over like a 200 year span. Where are they? They're everywhere. They're all over the place. They're, they're on the buildings, they're on the streets, they're, they're, they're in the ocean, they're in the water, uh, the, the river. They're all over the place. Uh, there is a reason why Wilmington is so haunted. Literally, we have buildings that go through people's bodies. And the general rule is, if you're doing construction nowadays, if somebody finds a bone and they report it, you see a bunch of white tents go up. And we actually have a, 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 like an archaeology and um, part of the division of UNC Wilmington with working with bones is because they were finding so many bones downtown during the 80s when they wanted to expand. And they're like, oop, it's really costly to have the taxes cover this. Let's have students who are paying tuition to do this. So um, yeah, when the white tents go up, that's usually a sign of like, oop, they found somebody. Wonder how old that somebody is. Though I also know for a fact that when people are not reported, as in uh, skeletons are not reported, if nobody finds out and they just kind of cover it up, that the building will go as planned through somebody. This has happened numerous times. I have talked to people on building sites about this and they'll just be like, yeah, we found somebody's head. And, you know, so-and-so didn't want us to say anything. So yeah, there's, there's a parking lot there now. <laughs> like reasons why a Wilmington's haunted. So here we have the oldest recognized burial ground. And it used to take up about a whole block. And it went out into what's now Market Street. It went across what's now 4th Street. It went across to the neighborhood that is now, um, or the, the housing that is now on 4th Street. Now, they decided to expand the town after uh, the Civil War. And they were like, whoop, we want a street here. We want to put some houses here. It's really prime real estate. And so they're like, whoo, there are bodies here. So uh, they moved some of the bodies out to Oakdale, which is another historical ground. Though you got to think about it. Some people back in the day, they didn't, they weren't able to afford tombstones. So you got a nice, you know, wooden cross on your grave or, you know, maybe a nice rock or something like that. Well, you know, first hurricane that comes through, that wooden cross is going to be in somebody else's yard. So um, they lost track of where all the bodies were. Because I'll tell you what, there was documentation of where everybody was buried. And during the, uh, it's weird calling it the Union occupation, because it really was just reclaiming Wilmington as part of the United States. Uh, 
they went around to a bunch of government places. Uh, they went around to churches. They wanted to know what the Confederacy had been up to for the last five years. And they got all this documentation from all these places and they put it in this big trunk. And they send it up to DC. And yeah, that's the last we heard of it. I don't know what happened to any of that stuff. Part of that documentation was where I was buried. So if you're wealthy and you could afford to move great grandpappy, yeah, you could do that. If all your family, I don't know, was knocked out from yellow fever, it's hard to do that. And let's say you weren't wealthy enough to have a tombstone. Yep, hard to be moved. Hard to know where you were. So they just put a street on top of a bunch of people. And uh, then they put a bunch of houses on a bunch of people. And I'll tell you what, there's a reason why most of those houses are rented out. They're rented out to, you know, college kids because a lot of times they can't afford to move because those houses be haunted. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, so here's the thing with St. James. I have a pretty good relationship with St. James. Some people, St. James makes them sick. <laughs> um, it's a unique kind of ground. The, if you ever are, if you're clairvoyant or you have a uh, mental eye uh, clairvoyance or even a kind of clairsentience, if you ever pick up on the guardian that is out here, they are large. They're large, they're very inhuman. Um, they look scary, I'll be real. Thing is though, we've offered uh, coins as offering to just you know hang out there. We've offered uh, bits of rum and the guardian's always chill about that. The guardian remembers me, remembers Jay. We don't do a lot of like work and working out there, but um, for the first live that I did on TikTok, which if you go back on uh, YouTube, it's way back there. Um, yeah, they were they were really chill. Uh, we felt very much surrounded, and that was even before I really considered myself, you know, out of the closet as a medium. Um, there are a variety of spirits there. A lot of them just hang out. They're they're super chill. Um, we have one spirit. Jay and I call him Dapper Dan. That is not his actual name, but he was a very fine fellow, and he came up and he wanted to have a conversation with us during that live. And we were like, we can't exactly perceive what you're saying, sir, but we can understand you're very proper and he seemed fine with that so yeah like we were envisioning like top hat tails you name it um yeah there are a variety of spirits here uh one of the ones that i ran into recently that was just really annoying was a guy that liked to i'm not the only one who's seen this guy other people in town have seen this guy this guy likes to be creepy he will rise up from his grave like just straight up out of the ground he knows what he looks like and then he'll look at you and then he'll run at you. He's done that twice to me now. He doesn't do that anymore. Uh, reason for, <laughs> I bopped him. It's a, it's a professional term. I bopped, the, I bopped the ghost. Uh, basically, I used my energetic shield and I just did that, knocked him over. He didn't follow. But he likes to run at people. He really, really gets a big kick out of that don't know who he is. I never asked for details because why would I? He's kind of a jerk. Um, other things though, let's see. This was a scarier thing though. Sometimes there are energies that hang out at this graveyard. And this is before I was doing any work in or anything like that. Before I knew about the guardian, I was still really much coming into my abilities. Um, I've seen these energies on some people before and other people on tours who are with spiritually sensitive people have seen them too. They are, or they can be inhuman. The one that followed me home was inhuman. Uh, it was just the perfect elements of me not being able to pay attention that particular night. I remember I was hosting my mom and my sister at my house and um, there were just a variety of elements that were just really not good. Like I had had an argument with Jay earlier in the day because I had family in town. We weren't able to really talk it out. It was just a lot of like hushed back and forth. I don't even remember what it was about. And, you know, family in town, they weren't stressful. But, you know, when anybody's in your home, it's it just changes the dynamic. And I had just done a double tour. And I was walking home with mom and my sister. And I noticed I was just like feeling really off. Like I was angry. And I just wanted to go to bed, but then like, I wasn't tired. It was just, I was really off. Get back to the house. 
the house which I affectionately call the bus stop um, because there was a ghost in every room. If you want to talk about a crash course and opening up spiritual abilities, move to a house that has a ghost in every room. Well, let me tell you. So that's where, if you're familiar with a recent skit on Gertie, uh, she was in that house, for example. And I'll tell you, Gertie was very helpful. Even though she did like to make the smoke alarm go off, especially if Jay and I were about to have funsy alone time, she did help out in the end. She was very particular on who she let in her house. So I was in the house. Uh, my mom, my sister had gone to sleep. Uh, Jay and I, we still weren't able to really resolve things before we go to bed, which is like, it's a big deal for us. We always try to resolve things before we go to sleep. And it was, it was a problem that we weren't able to. So there was just like a lot, a lot of factors on me being unbalanced at that point. I go to sleep and I wake up in the middle of the night and I was paralyzed. There was so much fear. I remember I was having some kind of nightmare and I woke up and I couldn't move. And I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. I was just like, okay, I had a bad dream. I'm feeling really bad. I'll just wake up, Jay. doesn't matter that we had a fight. I know he'll support me. And then it was like a voice in my head that said, he doesn't want to help you. So that was upsetting. And then I was like, I will call my dog. Mira was on her bed on the other side of our bed. And I was like, I'll call the dog. Uh, you know, like she'll, she'll make me feel better. And then the voice comes back and says, she won't hear you. They don't, they don't have, they are not, they're not here for you. Just really awful things. I felt like this terrible dread. On top of this, I could hear Mira whimpering in her sleep. So I realized something really, really bad was happening. And I just sent out a message of like, please help, somebody help me. Um, I, I, you know, whether it was the ghosts that I was still doubting myself on their being there or my ancestors or my people, my guides, I was just like, please, please, please help me. I can't move. And I saw from kind of the peripheral of my eye, the shadow that went across the wall that was on the far side. So I was like laying here and I was basically looking down at the wall. I see this shadow and then I see it move out of my periphery and then the smoke alarm goes off. The smoke alarm goes off and wakes up everybody in the house and it won't go off until Jay actually had to get a chair, drag it in, take the thing off the ceiling and pull the batteries out. There was no smoke. And I'll tell you, the room, basically we had had the door cracked a little bit on the hallway right outside, there was another smoke detector. So if there had been smoke, both of them would have gone off. But it was just the one in our room. So smoke alarm goes off. We finally get it to go off. I check in with my family. They're just like, well, that was weird, you know, and they go back to sleep. And then I check in with Jay and we're finally able to have a conversation. And I was like, Jay, I don't know what just happened, but something bad got into the house. I was having nightmares. I felt, I, I heard Mira, she was having nightmares. She was whimpering in her sleep. I saw the shadow, then the smoke alarm went off. I was like, I felt paralyzed. And that's when Jay said, yeah, I was having nightmares too. So next, like as soon as the sun was up, which technically we didn't have to wait for the sun to be up, but I wanted the sun to be up because it just made me feel better. As soon as the sun was up, we cleansed that thing out of the house. And not just the living cleansing it out of the house. Gertie was also right there with us. And a few of the other occupants were like, yeah, whatever that was, whatever you brought in, it's got to go. And then afterwards, I got a stern talking to or a stern feeling to because I wasn't fully sure what they were saying at the time. But um, yeah, a lot of them were just like, you got to be careful. You have to be smarter. Do not bring that back into the house or we will have issues. And I was like, okay, yep. I will try to do better next time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was one of the things that came out of St. James. However, since then, since I've become more aware and I've just simply stood up for myself, it hasn't happened since. So that's the thing with haunted places. I always like to tell people it matters who you are what you work with and where your willpower comes from. Because once I started to believe in myself, I haven't had something like that happen since.
though it's from my disbelief in myself and my abilities that it happened in the first place. And it was my also that day, my my mental health being unchecked as well. So yeah, St. James, I love it. Not everybody's cup of tea and that's entirely okay. Some people love other haunted spots over others and I think it's entirely okay. Just like some people love other places uh, over others or other people over other people. So that being said, uh, any questions on St. James or any of that? Cool, cool. Oh. oh, great question from Samantha. Do you generally suggest avoiding haunted areas when, what was the rest of that? When you're not feeling your best? Yeah, uh, it's why in part I did not go out tonight. Um, yeah, and I don't like admitting that. I'm just gonna be honest right now. I don't like admitting that. Uh, I came to a place where I was so tired that I was like, this whole month. That being said, though, you just wait for November. I'm so excited for November. This month has been a lot. Um, so yeah, uh, whether that's physically not feeling your best or mentally not feeling your best, or sometimes it's both. If you don't have to, don't. You can always go back out later. That's That's totally okay. Yeah, November is going to be great. That's right, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next up we are going to Ah yes, we're actually we're gonna hop on over to um Gallows Hill. I'll save Bellamy for another time. So this is Gallows Hill. And if you're thinking, well, that looks like a house, it's because it is. <laughs> um, this is a place up at the cross street of Fifth and Market. If you're ever on that side of town, you're going to notice a very random fountain in the middle of the road. If there is one place in Wilmington where a car is most likely to go through something, it is that fountain. You would think people would know how to drive around a fountain. Uh, tourists alike. I remember the first time we came here, we we're like, oh, there's a fountain in the middle of the road we just went around it it's really hard for some people to do apparently uh and we've spent all, so much of our tax money has gone to fixing that fountain and i have feelings about it anyway uh so mainly because that fountain was built by uh somebody who um was part of the uh coup d'etat of 1898 massacred a bunch of innocent people i digress so um is there no actual roundabout surrounding the fountain? Uh, it's just, it, it. there's even a light. Basically, it's not even a roundabout. It's just at the light, it tells you you can't turn or anything like that. All you have to do is just, that's really it. You go in straight, there's a fountain and you go whoop. That's it. People are awesome. Anyway, so um, that fountain is there. Caroline Apartments is there uh first Baptist church is there bellamy mansion is there and then you have gallows hill here all the places i just mentioned are very haunted very very haunted <laughs> um it's it, it, people don't even joke about it anymore it, like carolina apartments i was literally walking by and my ghost store get up and the guy was about to go in and he's like are you going to talk about the kids in the elevator i hate those kids in the elevator they're so creepy yeah um so, and that wasn't even on the tour at the time so fun facts uh same thing with first baptist church there was something hanging out that was big and gross and scary and inhuman that would hang out in the preschool hall for a while that was upsetting um and then in the bellamy mansion ooh, uh the last lady who lived there it, as the bellamy she was um what we would now modern in times call white supremacist um she was so angry about the war she was seven when the civil war happened so it was a very ingrained part of her life but to her dying day she was very convinced and this says it in the memoir you can actually buy her memoir and they have a really nice forward about it being like hey by the way um she still uses terminology that was never okay uh so yeah i read the book and i was like wolf woman um yeah she's just very angry and she's just very angry in her home now so there's a lot of stuff going on on that blog. 
And what's even wilder is she actually has to share the afterlife of her home with some Union soldiers who camped out there when uh, they were they the women to the city had just fallen back to the uh, United States. So she chose her afterlife. That was in fact a choice. Uh, so yeah, there's just a lot of anger there and some haunted dolls. Fun, 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 fun. Um, Price home across the street. So the Price home was built in 1860. So that was a year before the Civil War started. Um, Dr. Price was a medical doctor and he built this home for his family. They did not spend a lot of time here during the Civil War due to the yellow fever outbreak. Um, plus war and things were getting kind of rough in town, so they kind of popped out. But then they came back and they got their uh, land back and they got their house back and uh, the Price family lived there up until, I believe, about the 1960s. So here's the thing. This is why when I when people are like, oh, my house is new, it can't be haunted. I'm like, okay. Um, see this gravel lot right here? Um, that that's a part of gallows hill just like the price home is a part of gallows hill this is the tallest place in the city it's 42 feet above sea level and it was the main road in order to get into the city unless you're going to come in by boat and as a way to warn people to do good things they would string people up on the gallows out here now this was in the it was, let's see, the late, later part of the 1700s up until the mid 1800s. So right before they built this home. And a lot of times they didn't know where guys had come from because it was a port city. They could have come from anywhere. And even if they did know where they came from, they may not be able to afford a way to ship their body home because that was really expensive, not to mention during the summer months. It was just really awful. So something else I'll point out here is the justice system back in those days was very much Oop, caught in the wrong place at the wrong time we kill you tomorrow so some of these men are likely innocent just throwing that out there some of these men are not some of these men are really bad and uh because they didn't know where to bury them or ship them back to they just buried them here there may be 300 bodies right here under this parking lot um the running joke it's not a joke, but before the parking lot was there, uh, it was understood that the Price kids would run out and find bones after really heavy rain. Fine, right? Uh, yeah, so that's the thing. Now, I have not seen bones, and I'll be real, after the hurricanes, I do go out there just to be like, are they floating up? Um, yet to see any, but who knows? Yeah, uh, this house, it's it's got a lot going on. Um, there have been faces seen in the windows. Sometimes there's this kind of phantom candlelight, which has also been photographed. Um, there are, there's a guy who goes up the stairs. <laughs> there's a guy, a different guy who goes down the stairs. Um, there's, there's talk of a guy in a rocking chair. Um, there's just guys all over the place. Now, everybody's name, I don't know. And I'll tell you what, I never stuck around to find out because... First time I went out there was on the ghost tour because what do I do when I go to a town? I take the ghost tour because I want to know the dirty history. Um, the clean history is what the history tour for is for. The dirty history is what the ghost tour is for. So go on this ghost tour. I'm still in denial that I have any abilities or anything. I step on the property and I nearly threw up. It was really embarrassing. I could hardly hear anything that had to do with the story because I was trying to keep my guts down, essentially. I hadn't eaten anything in a few hours. It's totally weird. I'm like clutching Jay because he's with me on the tour and he's just kind of like looking down like, what? <laughs> we get off the grounds and it was just lifted. The sickness was lifted. No problems. And we're walking by and I was just like, Jay, the weirdest thing just happened. I nearly threw up and now I feel fine. And like, I'm ready to go eat dinner with you. And the tour guide was like, oh yeah, that happens sometimes. People get sick sometimes. We don't know why. <laughs> Haunting, <laughs> that's why. It's it's unexplained. Why would random people get sick out here? Uh, like th that is a paranormal experience that people who are otherwise unconnected have this similar experience. <laughs> um, there's a lightheadedness there. 
I, here's the other thing. Um, I had seen people get scratched out there before my eyes, like their arm would be there. And then suddenly blood, this place is not for the faint of heart. Um, I, I didn't take a lot of groups up there a lot of times. Um, one guy, cause we were allowed to let the guests roam the grounds, um, you know, respectfully. And I would always give them that warning and I would always say, I'm not going in after you. One guy actually, he was wearing beads cause at the tour at the time had beads and, um, his beads were pulled and he was nearly like face planted into the ground. These spirits have juju, <laughs> like they have a lot of energy to work off of um there was this is actually a skit that i did a while ago like years ago um it, it was actually something that happened on jay's tour where there was this woman who she just kept talking and talking and talking the whole time and jay was hard he was trying to get like two words out doing his job people are paying to have him speak not her and all the while she she was traveling alone i don't know why she was on this ghost tour and she kept going on and on about how ghosts weren't real and the tour was stupid and i don't know how jay had the patience because a lot of the other guides would have been like you can just go <laughs> they get over here and she keeps going on and on and on these ghosts aren't real nothing's gonna happen this is all bull like on and on and on and she keeps doing this because it's like something's messing with her right here. I'm just kind of like flicking a little bit. And she keeps like doing this, like it's somebody. And she thinks it's somebody. And in a way it is. She turns around to confront who was touching her. And then Jay basically sees the back of her head flip back. The woman was punched in the face. <laughs> she stopped talking after that. That's the kind of stuff that happens here. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, let's see, Tammy, you just asked, uh, is there a reason that they attack the living like that? Were they disrespecting the place? Well, besides <laughs> besides the, the lady. Um, in part, I think they're angry. In part, I think they're just doing what they can. Um, I think those who are not expecting it, but are otherwise not shielding, because there are some people who actually can shield, and that's why they don't believe in any of this, because they have no experiences, because that's not a part of their process. And they're really just putting out vibes of like, you know, nothing's gonna mess with me, and it actually works. Some people, like this woman in particular, I think she was so ungrounded that she was also susceptible to these things and just happened to be out of place where somebody could do something about it. Um, I had not heard of a woman being, or anybody being punched since then. Um, granted, I haven't been on the tour for uh, almost two years now. Um, people do still get tripped. Um, people get followed home. I was followed home from somebody here. Um, that experience was also when I was doubting my abilities. Uh, I was walking home and I had a lot of, like I had this weird sense of anxiety and it, there was no reason for it. Like at that point I was seeking mental health and, or mental help. And I was kind of talking to myself through the process and being like, okay, why do I feel this way? Where did it come from? And I kept getting blocks on like what in the world it was. Um, I just kept going. And what was weird was when I was downtown, I was getting a lot of strange attention from people like typically at that point, I would just like get done with work and like, unless I was going to get a drink with a friend, like I would just beeline up the, the hill. Um, but I was getting a lot of attention from men in particular and attention that I didn't like. And it's not like I was wearing anything in particular, like that was different. It was just a really weird vibe that kind of kicked me off a bit, a, a bit more. But then when I was up in the neighborhoods and just walking to my house, I still felt the feeling and I felt like somebody was following me and I kept looking behind me and not seeing anyone so i was just like okay i guess it's in my head but then i started to hear with my ears this kind of behind me like somebody was stepping behind me and then i would turn no one 
And then I, I would look around, I'm like, what are you in the bushes? Like, what, 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 what's going on? Like, it was really freaking me out because it was messing with me. Um, finally, I'm getting closer to home and I'm hearing the steps again. And I actually pull out my keys and I put them between my uh, fingers. I, I lived in some big cities over time. You pick up a few things to survive. And uh, I, I thought this was like a guy, like a corporeal being because it felt so close and I could hear him coming up on me. So basically I turned to defend myself and that's when I felt this energy move around me to the other side. And then he may have said something, I don't know, but at the time my clear audience was only so developed and I just heard a in my ear. So uh, I was about a block away from the house. I called up Jay and we were restarting our spiritual journey. And I was like, Jay, I don't know who this is. I do not want him coming home. Cause this was after the whole thing happened with the smoke alarm that I told you about. So Jay came out and he did some sort of cutting work, uh, just cleansing stuff. I talk about it, just, you know, making sure that he wasn't connected and then re-solidifying the wards around our home so that he couldn't follow in. Now here is the less than fun part. He stayed outside the home for three days, just watching, just seeing what would happen. Yeah really not great. Um, he followed me home from this place. I still don't know who he is. I really don't care. Uh, he eventually left. Good for him. Um, douche canoe. Thank you. <laughs> um, he stayed outside because he could, it was intimidating. That's the best thing I can come up with. Uh, another time though, I learned from this experience the next time I was followed home because I was followed home again. It was like some silly kind of dude and I kept telling him to stop following me because I was a bit more believing in myself at that point. And uh, I kept telling him, no, I made a skit about this like early, early on. And he just kept being like, oh yeah, okay, okay, okay. And then finally, like I looked at him and I had my staff, which really just made me feel better against corporeal people. Cause if they got too close, I could just hit them. I never had to do that, but it was pandemic and you know, you never have to, it was always good to be like, don't get close to me because I can't control my stick. You know, we tell people all kinds of stuff, but um, just to have them not breathe in my face. Cause it's so much to ask in the middle of a pandemic. Um, anywho, uh, he, I did have some protective elements on my staff and I still have it. It looks kind of like more ceremonial now, but yeah, this guy kept following me and I just like took my staff and I was like, you will not cross. Now he didn't know the reference, but I was just like, you will not cross. And like, I took the staff and I put it into the ground and then I made a line and I was like, you will not cross. And like, I meant it. And the guy was like, and then he turned around and left. I was like, that's right. I'm crazy. Like, don't, don't with me. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, next time you need to feel, I don't know, empowered, uh, lines from your favorite movie. That's fine. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I said this on the ghost story tales on Wednesday and I'll say it again. Uh, there's a reason why I woke up as quickly as I did. A lot of my spiritual journey has been doing this, and a lot of you will know. <laughs> Rebecca the Great, thank you. <laughs> uh, a lot of you will know that I had a lot of doubts for what I was doing. I thought it was in my head, I thought I was losing my mind. Um, and a lot of my life was like that. It was just like every now and then my intuition lined up and I need I could do the things, but this city trained me. This city is no joke. Um, it's a wonderful place to live. I love living here, though I have acclimated to living here. And that's one of the things when I have people visit who are spiritually sensitive now, I tend to have a talk with them. Some of them, once they get on the, like in the, the, the uh, property lines of the city, they know it. It's like this drop sort of feeling. It, it can be a lot to acclimate to, uh, especially for people who are not used to it. There's a reason why this is one of the most haunted cities in the South. Excuse me, people have talked about going to Savannah. They've talked about going to Charleston. They've talked about going to St. Augustine. And some of them will have similar experiences, but there's something about Wilmington that a lot of people have told me 
who are spiritually sensitive, when they get here, they feel it. So, yeah, I have a lot of happy-go-lucky stories that I share on my channel just because there's enough scary stuff as, as it is. But, you know, this is a time of reflection, this time of year, and it's also a time of, you know, some scarier stuff. And uh, it does remind me how far I've come when it comes to the not great things that have also happened to me in the city. But all the same, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be able to share what I learn with others in the hopes that their journeys kick off in their own individual ways. And, you know, at some point you think about something that maybe I did a skit about, even if it was funny and you just think, oh yeah, that was, that was really interesting. I don't want to make that decision, but you know, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most I can ask for. So yeah, uh, with ending all this, anybody have any questions or comments or anything like that that you want to um, get into? Oh yeah, thank you, Samantha. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not seeing anything come through. So uh, what I will say is I so greatly appreciate all of you being here. Um, oh, you have words, but <laughs> they can't get organized. My goodness. Um, skit with Molly noticing how men don't wash their hands lives in my apron free. <laughs> yeah. Ever since that happened, I'm like, I don't know if I can touch a random man again. And even when like handshakes happen, I'm like, whoop, germs pandemic Oop, can't can't touch you nope <laughs> oh goodness yeah um if anything for pandemic it was a great way to be like oh i don't i don't want to you know let's do a fist bump instead it's a great way um but yeah thank you all so much for being here thank you for uh being kind and patient on me you know, doing this ghost story thing instead. And as I said, I'll be putting a poll up and we can vote on places to go rather than it be a tour. It can be more of a experience. And I'm really excited to share that with all of you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to share my time with all of you. you. You all are a part of changing my life and really for the better. And I super appreciate that. So thanks for being here and thanks for being a part of the Patreon. And I look forward to more adventures with you in the future. Yay! So everybody have a great night. Please be safe for Halloween. Remember, you're stronger. You're just stronger. Just be stronger in general. You're stronger. I believe in you. You believe in you. We all good. Yep. Oh, yeah. I'm going to sleep after this. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> good night, everybody. And have a great night.